Uh, good morning and welcome to the eighth meeting of the committee in 2015. Uh, everyone present is asked to switch off mobile phones and other electronic equipment as they affect the broadcasting system. Some committee members may consult tablets during the meeting. This is because we provide meeting papers in digital format. Uh, apologies have been received today from Claire Adamson. Stuart Stevenson is here as our substitute. Welcome, Mr. Stevenson. Uh, and agenda item one today uh, is to decide whether to take item four on integrated health and social care complaints procedures uh, in private. Uh, are we agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Agenda item two today is consideration of six negative SSIs. They are the Local Governance Scotland Act 2004, Remuneration and Severance Payments, Amendment Regulations 2015, SSI 2015-7, the Disabled Purses Badges for Motor Vehicles Scotland Amendment Regulations 2015 SSI 2015-9, the Non-Domestic Rates Levying Scotland Amendment Regulations 2015 SSI 2015-49, the Non-Domestic Rating Valuation of Utilities Scotland Amendment Order 2015, SSI 2015-50, the Valuation Timetable Scotland Amendment Order 2015, SSI 2015-51, uh, and the Local Government Pension Scheme Governance Scotland Regulations 2015, SSI 2015-60. Uh, members have a cover note from the clerk explaining the instruments. As you will note, the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee did not have any comments to make on these instruments. Do members have any comments? No. Uh, are we agreed not to make any recommendation to the Parliament on these instruments? Thank you very much. Uh, our third item of business today is our consideration of the Community Empowerment Bill at Stage 2, and this is Day 1 of the process. Uh, I welcome Marco Biaggi, Minister for Local Government, uh, Local Government Community Empowerment, uh, his officials and also Drew Smith uh, as well. Before we move on to consideration of the amendments, I think it would be helpful if I set out the procedure uh, for stage two consideration. Everyone should ha have with them a copy of the bill as introduced, the marshalled list of amendments that was published on Monday and the groupings of amendments which set out the amendments in the order in which they will be debated. There will be one debate on each group of amendments. I will call the member who lodged the first amendment in each group to speak to and move their amendment and to speak to all the other amendments in the group. Members who have not lodged amendments in the group but who wish to speak should indicate that by catching my attention in the usual way. Uh, if he has not already spoken in the group, I will invite the minister to contribute to the debate just before I move to the winding up speech. The debate on each group will be concluded by me inviting the member who moved the First Amendment on the group to wind up. Following debate on each group, I will check whether the member who moved the First Amendment in the group wishes to press their amendment to a vote or to withdraw it. If they wish to press ahead, I will put the question on that amendment. If a member wishes to withdraw their amendment after it has been moved, they must seek the committee's agreement to do so. If any committee member objects, the committee must immediately move to the vote on the amendment. If any member does not want to move their amendment when I call it, they should say, not moved. Please remember that any other MSP may move such an amendment. If no one moves the amendment, I will immediately call the next amendment on the marshalled list. Only committee members are allowed to vote at stage two. Voting in any division is by show of hands. It is important that members keep their hands clearly raised until the clerk has recorded the vote. Uh, the committee is required to indicate formally that it has considered and agreed each section of the bill, and so I will put a question in each section at the uh, appropriate uh, point. Uh, and we will now move on to that uh, marshalled list. Um, the first uh, amendment is that in Group 1, uh, 1043, in the name of Alec Rowley, grouped with other, other amendments uh, as shown in the groupings. Can I point out to members that if amendments 1044 or 1012 in the group are agreed to, you, uh, that I cannot call amendments 1003 or 1050 respectively? Uh, can I ask Alec Rowley to move Amendment 1043 and speak to all amendments in the group? Mr Rowley. Uh, thank you, um, uh, 
convener, removing the, the, the group of amendments, uh, sorry, and speaking to the group of amendments, um, I'm pleased to move uh, Amendment 1043. Um, the purpose of these amendments is to ensure that the national outcomes for Scotland are created through a participative process that involves the people of Scotland and that all people have the opportunity to have a say in the outputs. To require Scottish ministers to lay a report before the Scottish Parliament every two years outlining the progress made towards achieving the national outcomes. This will be an important part of democratic focus in Scotland and will improve the involvement of local people in setting national outcomes. These uh, amendments are needed, in my view, to ensure that the national outcomes for Scotland are created through a participative process that involves the people of Scotland. This is important because of the known benefits of focus and delivery on the achievement of outcomes. However, it is being argued that in order for the bill to be sufficiently strengthened, it must involve all communities across Scotland and encourage their participation in setting the national outcomes. This is particularly true for those communities which are most disadvantaged and often described as hardest to reach. To ensure that ministers have involved all people who live and work in Scotland in the determination of the national outcomes, it is also suggested that there is a parliamentary mechanism for scrutiny. The Bill currently states that reports must be prepared and published at the same time as Scottish ministers consider appropriate. I would argue that there needs to be a greater duty on ministers to report on progress towards achieving the national outcomes. Scottish Ministers must, as soon as practical after the end of a two-year period, present a report to Parliament on the extent to which national outcomes have been achieved. The preparation of this report must be a participative exercise with Ministers consulting uh, a full range of communities. This will ensure progress towards achieving the national outcomes is transparent. It will involve the Parliament itself much more in the process and goes further to actually involving the Parliament in that process in national outcomes. Um, it will create a far greater transparency and accountability and a far greater involvement of local people and communities across Scotland. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Rowley. Can I call on the Minister to speak to Amendment 1003 uh, and other amendments in the group? Minister, please. Uh, thank you. And can I just say it's a pleasure to be in front of the committee again, and I hope this goes as well as the last stage two I attended. Um, Alex Rowley has set out his view on how Parliament should be involved. Uh, we also have the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee's recommendation that Scottish Parliament should have a more active scrutiny role in relation to national outcomes. And I agree with both that the scrutiny role of the Scottish Parliament should be strengthened in this process. I believe the way to do this is through consultation under Rule 17.5 of the Scottish Parliament's standing orders. This process best reflects the separation of powers between an executive responsible for setting the strategic direction of government and a parliament responsible for holding the government to account for its progress. Therefore, I don't think that the procedure which Alex Rowley proposes is the best one. I will go through my amendments in detail, but in summary, they would require Scottish ministers to consult with the Parliament when determining and also when reviewing national outcomes. The effect of Amendment 1003 is that having consulted such persons as they consider appropriate in order to determine the draft national outcomes, Scottish ministers must then consult the Scottish Parliament. Amendment 1004 is in consequence of Amendment 1003 and provides that the national outcomes cannot be published until the Scottish Parliament has been consulted. 1005 sets the period for parliamentary consultation at 40 days, beginning with the day the consultation document is laid before the Parliament or otherwise provided to the clerk. The process set out at Rule 17.5 of the Scottish Parliament's standing orders will apply to the consultation. I don't propose to go into further detail on that unless members would find it helpful. 1008 provides that in any review of the national outcomes, the Scottish ministers must consult such persons as they consider appropriate. Amendment 1012 removes the previous more restricted provision on this point, which had limited the consultation to where revisions were to be made. 
<coughs> Amendment 1009 provides that the Scottish Parliament is to be consulted in any review of the national outcomes. If, after a review has taken place, revisions are proposed to the national outcomes, this amendment provides that the Scottish Parliament will also be consulted on these revisions. If, after a review has taken place, no revisions are proposed, the Scottish Parliament will still be consulted on the existing national outcomes. Amendment 1014 specifies that the period for this parliamentary consultation is 40 days. The process set out at Rule 17.5 of the Scottish Parliament's standing orders would apply to the consultation. And amendments 1010 and 1011 provide that national outcomes may not be republished until after the 40-day period of consultation with the Scottish Parliament. Now, turning to Alex Rowley's proposal for a list of consultees, there are some concerns. By identifying certain individuals and groups, the scope of the consultation is unavoidably narrowed, with some persons given greater significance in statute than others. For example, the list gives prominence to some organisations, such as those working for children and young people, but not those working in other sectors, such as, for example, homeless people or equality organisations. The current wording allows flexibility for the consultation process to be appropriate to different situations. For example, where a review focuses on a specialist issue, it may be more appropriate to limit the scope of consultation to those who have expertise, experience and interest in that area. On the other hand, we would anticipate that all governments would want to consult widely and inclusively on the national outcomes as a whole. The duty needs to be carried out reasonably and as such entails that anyone who could reasonably expect to be consulted will be consulted. We have also proposed amendments which extend the requirement for consultation when the national outcomes are reviewed. The proposed amendments ensure that in the course of any review of the national outcomes, the Scottish ministers are required to consult. Both Alex Rowley and Drew Smith propose legislating for the provision of a report on the consultation process. And I agree with the principle behind this, but don't agree that it requires legislation. When the national outcomes are provided to the Parliament, we would, as a matter of good practice, and indeed I believe any government would, provide a note on the process and findings of the consultation. This gives the Parliament an opportunity to comment on the consultation process. Finally, I'd like to turn to Alex Rowley's proposals for reporting on the national outcomes. I don't think it is appropriate to legislate for how and when future governments report on the national outcomes, because the format and timing of the reporting should be for the government of the day to decide. The way we communicate and receive information is moving at such a pace that we would rather allow for future innovative approaches to reporting. There have been discussions recently in Parliament uh, about the appropriateness of certain timescales of data being reported, and this should be something that can be uh, adapted uh, in light of experience. A case could be made for reporting on progress at any time of the year, for example, at the beginning or the end of the parliamentary session, before or alongside the draft budget, and so on. As such, I believe it is best to leave this flexible uh, and subject to parliamentary scrutiny. This government reports through the Scotland Performs website, which provides an up-to-the-minute picture of progress towards the national outcomes. Updates are continually made available as soon as the latest data is published. So Scotland Performs is always showing the most up-to-date information. We also provide a Scotland Performs update to support the draft budget scrutiny process, including performance scorecards and narrative to show performance against national outcomes. And this is how we currently undertake our annual reporting. We would rather not limit future governments uh, into an inflexible model by prescribing the format and timing of reporting. I don't think it is appropriate to ask that the Scottish, government, uh, Scottish Minister should consult with those listed in uh, preparing any report on progress towards national outcomes. Any report on progress would be a factual statement based on evidence. Consultation on that does not seem appropriate in this context. I would therefore invite uh, Alex Rowley to withdraw Amendment 1043 and ask him and Drew Smith not to move their other amendments. And I ask the committee to support Amendments 1003, 4, 5, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 and 14. Thank you, Minister. I now call Drew Smith to speak to Amendment 1045. Mr Smith, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Convener, for the opportunity to take part in uh, Stage 2 proceedings of the Committee um, this morning. Um, I note what the Minister says and thank him for his agreement on uh, perhaps the sentiment um, uh, that we're exploring in, and certainly in my own Amendment uh, 1045. Um, the 
uh, purpose of the amendment, in my view, convener, is, to, uh, is that it adds a greater degree of consistency because the bill does impose uh, a duty on community planning partnerships, and the committee itself has previously concluded uh, that the same standards of transparency and ac accountability should uh, apply to others um, in this progress in this process. So, my argument would simply be that the Scottish government, in this respect, should. Uh, lead by example. Um, the two uh, specific uh, Ali Rowley's amendments referred to um, reporting on the progress towards national um, outcomes. The two uh, 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 additional points that my amendment would add in um, the, uh, that the government would set out how national uh, outcomes have actually been improved uh, following consultation um, and demonstrate that the results of a consultation have actually influenced um, uh, these improvements. Um, this is something that I think the committee itself was interested in, in uh, paragraph 107 of its stage one report uh, when it, it suggested that we would want to see the Scottish Government lead by example uh, in relation to consultation uh, and engagement. I know what the Minister says about not feeling that legislation would be the most uh, appropriate way to ensure this happens, but I would make the point that uh, the Bill does uh, require um, uh, community planning partnerships um, to, uh, to report in this way, so it does not seem to me to be too onerous to expect the Government to do the same. Thank you. Stuart Stevenson, please. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. I particularly wanted to address the contents of Alec Rowley's Amendment 1049. Um, I, th I think it has some really quite serious practical issues that are not uh, adequately covered by the way it's drafted. In particular, um, at uh, Section 3, it uh, provides that uh, Scottish ministers must lay a copy of the proposed draft regulations before the Parliament. Fine, except that the amendment does not provide uh, for the handcuffs that the government has provided in its uh, amendment uh, that you cannot withdraw them during the consultation period. And I can see that uh, governments could uh, find themselves in a position where they would wish to withdraw the amendments during the consultation, which would, of course, create considerable difficulties for the consultees. So in that respect, uh, I think the government's uh, approach is much to be preferred. There is stability during the consultation period, uh, whereas the way in which 1049 is drafted does not uh, provide that kind of uh, uh, stability. I also uh, want to talk about uh, the reporting issue. Um, it is uh, deceptively attractive to prescribe when uh, reporting may be done, um, but the construct and the way it is uh, produced means that, in essence, reporting cannot be done at other time. Now, this is a wide-ranging bill covering a wide range of policy areas and subjects, and the reference to the Scotland Performance is very appropriate because, of course, you may wish to provide updates at the timely point. I can see members getting intensely frustrated as they rise to their feet to question minister at oral questions, and the minister says, I'm not allowed to report under this uh, bill an amendment that was passed on the 4th of March uh, 2015 does not allow me to report to Parliament until the particular date. And members will get intensely uh, f frustrated with that. Far better that the government has the ability to in a timely and appropriate way across a wide range of policy areas, make such reports and updates and disclosures as is possible, and that we don't get ourselves in a position of passing a piece of legislation that prevents and inhibits members from questioning and demanding answers from ministers, which the amendments carry the very real danger of doing. Thank you. Does anyone else wish to enter the debate? No. In which case, can I call Alec Crowley to wind up and press her withdrawal? I thank you, um, convener, and I thank the minister um, for, for his sentiment, as, as Drew says, in terms of this bill. I would, I would say that, that you pronounce my name Alec with a, a C. Um, but anyway, um, in, terms, in terms of the, the national outcomes, and it comes to Stuart's point as well, in terms of reporting every two years, I think it's right that there is a requirement to report and you know, at that point in time, um, we will we will be able to, as a parliament, be able to um, see what progress is actually being made in terms of the national outcomes and hold the government to account. Um, and it shouldn't therefore be left to the government to 
to decide if it's of an appropriate time or not um, to what progress has been made. And that's, that, that's why I think it, is, it brings a greater degree of accountability into the process. Um, likewise, the minister, the minister says that he, he, he does want to see a greater role uh, in terms of, of, of the, for the Parliament than that which is currently outlined in the Bill. Um, I would argue that the amendments that are being put forward um, actually does create that greater role for Parliament, but communities should also have a, a far greater role in terms of having an input into setting national outcomes and holding to account um, the government of the day for doing so. Um, so so I'd really just repeat that I think the, the amendments that are tabled will bring a, a greater transparency, um, a greater involvement and a greater accountability in terms of this whole process. And with that, I would want to press. Thank you. Uh, the question is that Amendment 1043 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. Uh, we are not agreed and there will be a vote. Uh, those voting for the amendment, please raise their hands now. Those voting against the amendment, please raise their hands now. Those abstaining, there are none. Uh, the result of uh, the vote in amendment 1043, those in favour, four. Uh, those against, three. Uh, the question is agreed to. Uh, we move on uh, uh, to Group 2, functions to which national outcomes relate and duty of bodies exercising those functions. Uh, I will call Amendment 1001 in the name of the Minister, grouped with other amendments as shown in the groupings. Can I point out that if Amendment 1006 in the group is agreed to, uh, I cannot call amendments 1046, 1047 or 1048. Uh, Minister, can I ask you to move 1001 and speak to all amendments in the group, please? Thank you, Convener. This group covers a number of amendments to improve the structure and clarify points in section 1. Amendment 1001 is in response to a question from parliamentary authorities as to whether the bill placed a duty on the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body to have regard to the national outcomes in carrying out their functions. This was not the intention, as the primary role of the Scottish Parliament is to hold the Scottish Government to account. This amendment is therefore for the avoidance of doubt. 1006 and 1013 are consequential to 1001. 1007 is a minor technical amendment to avoid repetition. It provides that when the Scotland Act 1998 is subsequently referred to in the subsection, it is referred to as that Act. Turning to the other amendments in the group, I recognise the concerns that the committee has raised over complex legal language. I can only assume that Cameron Buchanan intends these amendments to simplify the language of the bill. However, we have used the term have regard to because it is a term which is generally used when referring to external documents. It's well understood by the bodies it applies to and the courts, and there is substantial case law setting out how it is to be interpreted. It doesn't require a person to follow guidance to the letter or to match their activities exactly to the national outcomes or guidance, but it requires them to be aware of that material and to have reasons for any departure from it. I therefore invite Cameron Buchanan not to move his amendments and ask the committee to support amendments 1001, 6, 7 and 13. I move amendment 1001. Thank you. Can I call Cameron Buchanan to speak to amendment 1006A and other amendments in the group? Mr Buchanan, please. Thank you very much, convener. My uh, reason for this was because I wanted to make it a bit weaker. I think having regard to it was too strong, and I think consider was therefore going to be we a weaker or a less uh, draconian uh, consideration. That's why I would like to press these amendments. Thank you. Stuart Stevenson, please. Uh, thank you, convener. I, I just wanted to perhaps invite the minister to, in his concluding remarks, just to expand on... Uh, in 1001 at 1C, uh, where he excludes things where the Scottish Parliament, the Scottish corporate body, are contributing to an outcome. And I wonder if that is more restrictive than the Minister really intended, because 
I can envisage circumstances where it is perfectly proper with the responsibility lying with the minister, but a contribution being made by the Scottish Parliament or the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body. And I'd just be interested to hear the minister's views on that and perhaps uh, whether in the light of my raising this, he might want to think about this uh, if it's appropriate at stage three. Uh, does anyone else wish to enter the debate? No. Minister, would you uh, please wind up? Thank you. Well, I think we simply have a, a difference here of opinion as to how uh, much consideration should be given to these national outcomes. Um, I'm quite clear that we should be quite, uh, quite strong on them, but allow all organisations, public bodies to... Uh, depart where they do have good reason. I think have regard to, as I said, is quite clearly uh, precedented on that while striking the correct balance. With regard to the issue raised by Stuart Stevenson, there, are, uh, there, there have been discussions over concerns raised by the Chief Executive. This has uh, been dealt with through uh, negotiation and drafting in those ways to try and cover all of the concerns raised by the Scottish Parliament. I don't believe this is going to lead to unintended consequences. We'll happily um, re-examine that uh, to check, but I would be confident that this is capturing the separation of Parliament and government that we are trying to make sure has no doubt in this bill. Thank you. Uh, the question is that Amendment 1001 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Uh, we are all agreed. We now move on to uh, Group 3, which is National Outcomes, Inequalities re Resulting from Socio-Economic Disadvantage. I call Amendment 1002 in the name of the Minister and a group in its own. Uh, Minister, could you move and speak to your amendment? Thanks, Convener. Uh, we're committed to building a fairer Scotland and reducing inequalities, and so uh, wish to make this a more explicit aim throughout the Bill. This amendment in particular requires that when determining the national outcomes, Scottish ministers must have regard to the reduction of inequalities of outcome which result from socio-economic disadvantage. And I'm hopeful that the committee will support this requirement. Thank you. Does any other member wish to speak? Uh, Minister, I take it you don't wish to wind up. Uh, in which case, can I ask if, uh, that Amendment 1002 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? agreed. Thank you very much. Uh, can I call Amendment 1044 uh, in the name of Alec Rowley, already debated with Amendment 1043? Can I remind members that if Amendment 1044 is agreed to, you cannot call, that I cannot call Amendment uh, 1003? Alec Rowley, can I ask you to move or not move? A move, convener. Thank you. Uh, the question is that Amendment 1044 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. No. Uh, in which case, we are not agreed and there will be a vote. Those voting for the amendment, uh, please raise their hands now. And those against the amendment, please show. Uh, thank you. Uh, total votes cast. Two uh, for the amendment, five against. The question is disagreed to. Uh, I now move on to amendment 1003 in the name of the minister already a uh, debated with Amendment 1043. Minister, could you move formally, please? Move formally. Uh, can I ask the question that Amendment 1003 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Can I call Amendment 1004 in the name of the Minister, already debated with um, Amendment 1043? Minister, could you move formally? Formally moved. Uh, the question is that Amendment 1004 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. 
Can I call Amendment 1005 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 1043. Minister, could you move formally? Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 1005 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Uh, can I call Amendment 1045 in the name of Drew Smith, already debated with Amendment 1043. Mr Smith, to move or not move? Move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 1045 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Uh, we're, are, we are not agreed and there will be a vote. Uh, those voting for the amendment, please raise their hands now. And those uh, against the amendment, please raise their hands now. Any abstentions? The result is uh, voting for the amendment three and against four. Uh, the question is disagreed to. Uh, can I call amendment 1006 in the name of the minister already debated with amendment 1001. Can I remind members that if amendment 1006 is agreed to, you cannot call, that I cannot call amendment 1046, 1047 or 1048. Minister, can I ask you to move formally? Moved. Uh, can I call amendment uh, 1006, 0006A in the name of Cameron Buchanan, already debated with amendment 1001. Uh, Mr Buchanan, uh, move or not move? Moved. Thank you. Uh, the question is that Amendment 1006A be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Yes. Uh, we are not agreed and there will be a vote. Uh, those voting for the amendment, please raise their hands now. Uh, okay, and those against the amendment, please show now. Uh, those uh, for the amendment three, those against four, uh, the question is disagreed to. Um, the question is that amendment 1006 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed in that one. Um, I now call Amendment 1007 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 1001. Minister, could you move formally, please? Moved. Uh, the question is that Amendment 1007 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. The question is that Section 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Mr Stevenson. Just wondering what... Oh, what, it's all right. It's the preemption. OK. Uh, is that you questioning me? Yes, Mr. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm just seeking to okay. be of assistance. Yeah, OK, Thank Mr. You. Stevenson, I think we're all right here. Uh, the question is that Section 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. Thank you. Um, I now call Amendment 1049 in the name of Alec Rowley, already debated with Amendment 1043. Uh, Alec Rowley, uh, to move or not move? May move, convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 1049 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Uh, there, we are not agreed and there will be a vote. Uh, those voting for the amendment, please raise their hands now. And those against the amendment, please show. Uh, those in favour of the amendment, four. Those against, three. The question is agreed to. Uh, can I call amendments 1008, 1009, 1010 and 1011, all of, in the name of the Minister and all previously debated? Uh, Minister, can I invite you to move amendments 1008 to 1011 on block, please? 
can I just have a moment to confer on the uh, implications of the last yeah. amendment? Thank you. Uh, does any member object to a single question being put in amendments 1008 to 1011? Okay. If no member objects, the question is that amendments 1008 to 1011 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, can I call amendment 1012 in the name of the Minister, already debated with amendment 1043? Uh, can I remind members that if amendment 1 1012 is agreed to, uh, then I cannot call Amendment 1050. Minister, can I ask you to move formally? Moved. Thank you. Uh, the question is that Amendment 1012 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Uh, can I call Amendment 1013 in the name of the Minister? Already debated it with Amendment 1001. Minister, can I ask you to move formally? Moved. Uh, the question is that Amendment 1013 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Uh, thank you. Can I call Amendment 1014 in the name of the Minister? Already debated with Amendment 1043. Minister, can I ask you to move formally? Moved. Uh, the question is that Amendment 1014 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Agreed. Uh, the question is that Section 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Can I call Amendment 1051 in the name of Alec Rowley? Already debated with Amendment 1043. Uh, Mr Rowley, to move or not move? Please to move, convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 1051 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Uh, we are not agreed and there will be a vote. Uh, those voting for the amendment, please raise their hands now. And those voting against the amendment, please raise their hands now. Uh, those for the amendment, four. Those against, three. The question is agreed to. Uh, I now call amendment 1052 in the name of Alec Rowley, already debated with amendment 1043. Mr Rowley, to move or not move? To move, convener. Thank you very much. The question is that amendment 1052 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Uh, in which case we move to a vote. Uh, those voting for the amendment, please raise their hands now. And those against the amendment, please show now. Thank you. Those for the amendment, four. Those against the amendment, three. Uh, the question is uh, agreed to. Uh, the question is that section three be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. Thank you. Uh, can I call Amendment 1053 in the name of Alec Rowley, uh, Rowley sorry, already debated with Amendment 1043? Uh, Mr Rowley, to move or not move? To move, convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 1053 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Uh, we are not agreed, uh, and there will be a vote. Those voting for the amendment, please raise their hands now. Thank you. And those against the amendment, please show now. Thank you. Uh, those in favour of the amendment, four. Those against, three. The question is agreed to. Uh, we now move on to group four, duty to carry out community planning in general. Can I call amendment 1015 in the name of the minister, grouped with other amendments as shown in the grouping. Minister, can I ask you to move amendment 1015 and speak to all amendments in the group, please? Uh, excuse me, can I just point out that officials will be uh, moving at this point because we are moving from one part to the other and I don't intend any uh, disruption or disrespect. That's fine, Minister. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is a group four. This is a group of amendments which mainly adjust the wording of the bill uh, to bring it closer to our policy intentions and to provide consistency in the language of different sections. 
The essence of community planning under the Bill is that public sector bodies should work together and with local communities to improve outcomes for local communities. The Bill should place duties on community planning partnerships and on community planning partners, but not on community bodies themselves. Section 4.1 of the Bill, as introduced, places a duty on community planning partners and community bodies to participate with each other in community planning, which is defined in Section 4.2. Amendments 1015 to 1018 adjust the wording to avoid placing duties on community bodies. Amendment 1015 replaces section 4.1 with a provision which imposes a duty on community planning partners to carry out community planning for a purpose mentioned in section 4.2. Amendment 1016 amends section 4.2 to provide that the purpose of community planning is improvement in the achievement of outcomes resulting from or contributed to by the provision of services delivered by or on behalf of the community planning partners. Amendment 1017 is consequential to 1015 and 1016. 1018 places a duty on community planning partners when carrying out community planning to participate with each other and to participate with community bodies who wish to participate in community planning in a way that enables those bodies to participate to the extent that they wish to do so. Unlike Section 4 of the Bill as introduced, it imposes no duty on community bodies to participate in community planning. 1019 and 1020 make minor drafting changes to the definitions of community planning partnership and community planning partner in section 44 of the bill. They have no substantive effect. 1026, uh, under the Historic Environment Scotland Act 2014, Historic Environment Scotland is established and has the general function of investigating, caring for and promoting Scotland's historic environment. Historic Environment Scotland will become fully operational on the 1st of October 2015. Historic Environment Scotland will be a valuable community planning partner. Indeed, the 2014 Act places a specific duty on Historic Environment Scotland in exercising its functions to, quote, have regard as may be appropriate in the circumstances to the interests of local communities, unquote. Having the role of a community planning partner will be one important way in which this duty can be delivered. We consider that it is therefore appropriate to include Historic Environment Scotland in the list of community planning partners in Schedule 1. Amendment 1027 replaces Section 52A with a reworded provision. It's a minor amendment and has no substantive effect. 1028 is consequential to 1027. Section 5.1 of the Bill provides that each community planning partnership must prepare and publish a local outcomes improvement plan. Section 52A provides that this plan must set out each local outcome to which the community planning partnership is to give priority with a view to improving the achievement of the outcome. Amendment 103.2 is another which seeks to simplify the language in the Bill by adding consistency so that we refer to person in both subsections of Section 8, which imposes uh, governance duties in relation to the facilitation of community planning and the carrying out of community planning functions by community planning partnerships. Section 8.1 refers to each community planning partner, while Section 8.2 identifies the person referred to as community planning partners in Section 8.1. Amendment 1037 is consequential to Amendments 1015 and 1016 to reflect the fact that community planning is now defined in subsection 1 rather than subsection 2 of section 4. Amendment 1038 relates to section 46 of the Bill, which gives the Scottish Minister's powers to make regulations modifying the list of persons in Schedule 1 who are community planning partners to add a person or description of person or remove or amend an entry. It also relates to Section 8.3, which gives the Scottish Minister's powers to make regulations to add a person or description of person to the list of community planning partners with governance duties, or to remove or amend an entry in the list. The Bill currently proposes that the exercise of these powers is subject to the negative parliamentary procedure. In my response, dated 19th December to the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee report, I indicated my agreement with their recommendation regarding changing that parliamentary procedure to the affirmative procedure. This amendment therefore provides that regulations which modify the list of community planning partners or the list of governance partners are subject to the affirmative procedure and therefore to a higher level of scrutiny 
by the Scottish Parliament. Amendments 1039, 1040 and 1041 add to the list of consequential amendments to other legislation arising from this bill in Schedule 4. And if it briefly, if it helps the, the committee, I can briefly summarise what these do. Um, 1039 ensures that references to community planning duties in the Local Government Scotland Act 1973 relate to duties under this bill, not the 2003 Act. Uh, section 99 of the 1973 Act places a set of general duties on local government auditors. One of these is for auditors to satisfy themselves that the local authority is complying with its community planning duties. Section 1021C of that Act provides for the controller of audit to make reports to the Accounts Commission on how a local authority has discharged its community planning duties. It is important to bring that up to date. Amendment 1040 alters Section 572A of the Local Government in Scotland Act 2003. That provision allows ministers to, by order, amend, repeal, revoke or disapply any enactment in certain situations. One of those situations is where ministers consider the enactment prevents local authorities from discharging their community planning functions under Section 15.1 of the 2003 Act. Since the, the bill repeals Part 2 of the 2003 Act, this amendment removes the redundant reference. 1041 updates references to community planning in the Fire Scotland Act 2005 and the Police and Fire Reform Scotland Act 2012. In both Acts, these references to community planning apply to two issues. The first is relation to local plans, uh, where Section 41E of the 2005 Act requires the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service to produce a local fire and rescue plan for each local authority area. Similarly, the 2012 Act requires the relevant local police commander to produce a local police plan for each local authority area. In both of these cases, these plans must, amongst other things, set out how fire and rescue or policing priorities and objectives will, be, uh, will contribute to the delivery of any relevant local outcomes identified by community planning. 1041 updates statutory references uh, to community planning for these purposes. The other issue arises in relation to delegation of functions. The 2005 Act requires uh, the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service to delegate certain functions, including community planning functions, to a local senior officer. Uh, likewise, the 2012 Act requires the Chief Constable of Police Scotland to delegate his or her community planning functions to the local commander for that area. 1041 also updates statutory references to community planning for these purposes. 1042 repeals uh, Section 57.2b of the Local Government in Scotland Act 2003. That section currently allows ministers to, by order, amend, repeal, revoke or disapply any amendment in situations where ministers consider the enactment prevents community planning partners from discharging their community planning functions under sections 15 and 16 of the 2003 Act. But the community planning provisions in this bill will replace those in the 2003 Act. Schedule 5 repeals Part 2 of the 2003 Act and as a result, Section 57.2b of that Act becomes uh, redundant. We consider there is no need to replicate this provision for community planning duties in this bill. Section 97 uh, provides ministers with the means to cover this situation through a general power to make incidental, supplementary, consequential, transitional or transitory provision by order. So having uh, gone through all that, I ask the committee to agree to these amendments and I move Amendment 1015. Thank you. Does anyone wish to enter the debate at this point? Uh, Minister, I take it that you don't want to wind up. Uh, the question is then that Amendment 1015 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed? Thank you. Can I call Amendments 1016, 1017 and 1018, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated? Uh, Minister, can I ask you to move Amendments 1016 to 1018 on block, please? Moved on block. Uh, can I ask if any member objects to a single question being put on these amendments? Uh, in which case, can I ask that amendments 1016 to 1018 are agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you very much. 
can I call Amendment uh, 1054 in Group 5, which is relationships between national outcomes and local outcomes. 1054 is in the name of Drew Smith and a group in its own. Mr Smith, can I ask you to move and speak to your amendment? Thank you very much, um, Convener. The, uh, this returns, uh, members were been listening in the, the previous group, it returns us to uh, Section 4.3, Community Planning uh, of the Bill, um, uh, where, as drafted, um, uh, the requirement is for lo that local uh, outcomes must be consistent uh, with national uh, outcomes. And the purpose and effect of my amendment is to change that uh, to be the community planning partnerships uh, in setting these uh, uh, the outcomes um, must have regard to national outcomes as opposed to be consistent uh, with national outcomes. And I think there is, um, we had an earlier debate uh, convening around uh, the consistent use of language and uh, a debate as to whether or not uh, have, have the, the, the view that Mr Buchanan put forward was that have regard to was a, a stronger position perhaps than consider. Um, I would contend that uh, be consistent with uh, would be stronger still and could run the risk um, of uh, creating a situation where um, national outcomes and local outcomes uh, may be in conflict, perhaps as a, actually as a result of a participation um, request, a local outcome uh, may be set. But if, uh, 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 if the bill as uh, drafted was passed, then there, there could be a danger um, that the national outcome uh, may be seen to override um, the local outcome. So I believe that uh, there certainly is a case uh, uh, um, that... Uh, local authority, that local partners should uh, have regard to the national outcomes, but I think it would be too far uh, to expect all local outcomes to be uh, completely consistent with national outcomes. Thank you. And I move the amendment. Thank you. Stuart Stevenson, please. Uh, thank you, Convera. Um, in uh, introducing into the, the replacement uh, subsection here, three, uh, the term community planning partnership, I'm, I'm just left feeling slightly uneasy that by specifying that and that alone, the scope that's covered by the amendment is more limited than the scope uh, of what is being deleted, which makes no such specific reference to community planning partnership. Now, I'm unclear, genuinely, uh, uh, as to that, and I'd just invite the member uh, to, to, to perhaps um, help me understand if my, my fears are correct or whether that is a matter he considered or, or in particular why he chose to introduce the very specific term, community planning partnership in his amendment which did not occur uh, in the uh, words that he's deleted um, at uh, line uh, 16. Okay, does anyone else wish to enter the debate? No, in which case, Minister. Thank you, Convener. Amendment 1054 imposes a duty on community planning partnerships in setting outcomes to have regard to, rather than uh, as proposed uh, local, uh, in Section 4, that local outcomes whose achievement is to be improved by community planning have to be consistent with. Those are two changes as uh, the member uh, pointed out. This amendment also assumes a duty on community planning partnerships to set outcomes. Uh, a statutory provision requiring a CPP to have regard to national outcomes will not ensure that local outcomes reflect the national outcomes in the way that a duty to be consistent will. A duty to have regard to requires that it be considered, not that it be followed. And a local outcome could have a recognisable impact in a variety of ways on many national outcomes. Uh, local objectives to improve mental health might Im impact on what we currently have as national outcomes. Six and seven, we live in uh, longer, healthier lives and we've tackled the significant inequalities of Scottish society. If the national outcomes are created by a participative process they, and uh, we have set that out already, they will be uh, all-encompassing but also able to be aligned very effectively for uh, local priorities as well. Um, the, the terminology consistent with, because we do feel we need that stronger link to link up local plans, national plans, national outcomes, local outcomes. And this enables us to ensure that local outcomes, which are objectives for local areas and the national outcomes, are aligned. Um, there is also, as we said, no duty on CPPs to set outcomes, only to identify those which are to be prioritised under Section 5.2. The requirement for local outcomes to be consistent with 
national outcomes arises from the description of community planning in section 42 combined with 43 this could therefore create difficulties and confusion on the purpose of CPPs in that regard. I would ask uh, Drew Smith to, to withdraw the amendment. Thank you. Uh, can I call on uh, Mr Smith to wind up and to press her withdraw? Um, thank you, uh, uh, convener. Listen carefully to, to Mr Stewart's comments and indeed to um, uh, uh, Mr. Mr Stewart and to the, and to the Minister, uh, Mr Stewart. Um, but uh, uh, I, I think I, I will um, press the amendment. I understand the concern that's been raised, but I, I would press the amendment because it, it, in the way that it's drafted, um, it... it it, it, it is uh, restricting the, the issue to community planning partnerships, and I believe that community planning partnerships do have uh, uh, their own processes here, um, where it would be legitimate for them to set uh, 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 their own local objectives, um, which certainly um, should have regard to national outcomes. I do not believe uh, that they would require um, to be uh, completely consistent at all times, um, and I think uh, to require that it would be against uh, the spirit of the bill, and I would therefore press. Okay. Uh, the question is that Amendment 1054 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Yes. Uh, we're not all agreed. We will move to the vote. Those voting for the amendment, please raise their hands now. And those against the amendment, please show now. Uh, those for the amendment, three. Those against the amendment, four. The question is disagreed to. Uh, can I call amendment 1019 in the name of the minister, already debated with amendment 1015. Minister, could I ask you to move formally? Formally moved. Thank you. The question is that amendment 1019 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Can I call amendment 1020 in the name of the Minister? Already debated with amendment 1015. Minister, can I ask you to move formally? Moved. Thank you. Uh, the question is that amendment 1020 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Uh, group 6 is the effectiveness of community planning in involving communities uh, tackling inequality, etc. Can I call amendment 1021 in the name of the Minister? Group with other amendments as shown in the groupings. Minister, can I ask you to move amendment 1021 and speak to all amendments in the group, please? Thank you, Convener. Uh, amendment 1021 itself is a minor drafting amendment which has no uh, substantive effect. It provides that duties for CPPs in Section 4.5 apply to each community planning partnership instead of a community planning partnership. Amendments 1023 and 1024 are likewise minor drafting amendments which have uh, no substantive effect, replacing such with those. Uh, amendment 1030 is also a minor technical amendment which uh, I believe it provides spacing. Uh, having disposed of these, though, I would turn to the substantive amendments in the group. Amendment 1022 relates to the focus on addressing inequalities, which was a feature of written submissions. It was a recurrent subject uh, of debate uh, at stage one during committee's evidence sessions. And we know that some communities are better placed to have their views considered and acted upon uh, than others. The committee's stage one report referred to the risk of empowering only the already empowered. Many, including Bernardo Scotland, Oxfam, Poverty Alliance, emphasised in their contributions that community planning partnerships need to ensure that they take account of those experiencing uh, dis the disadvantages associated with socioeconomic inequalities. Community planning partnerships are already addressing inequalities in their work, but we want them to do more. And that's why this amendment would make it explicit that community planning partnerships, when considering which community bodies are likely to contribute to community planning must have regard uh, in particular to those bodies which represent the interests of persons experiencing inequalities of outcome which result from socio-economic disadvantage. This then triggers the requirement to make all reasonable efforts to secure their participation. 1025 also relates to the committee's recommendation that Quote, there should be a specific duty on CPP partners to reduce inequality and focus on prevention. Unquote. The Scottish Government and our partners on the National Community Planning Group agree that taking action to reduce inequalities should be at the heart of what community planning partnerships do. In fact, as we've shown from the outcomes, we believe it should be at the heart of what uh, the whole of the government should be doing. 
and this amendment introduces a general duty on community planning partnerships to act with a view to reducing inequalities of outcome that result from socioeconomic disadvantage. The duty would apply to how a community planning partnership undertakes all of its functions under part two of the bill, from securing participation by community bodies to the local outcomes they prioritise in their local outcomes improvement plan. It also includes how community planning partnerships review progress and the continued suitability of their plan and how they report on progress each year to local communities. The amendment includes a qualification which allows a community planning partnership not to act with a view to reducing inequalities of outcome which result from socioeconomic disadvantage where it considers it inappropriate to do so. This qualification recognises that although a community planning partnership may undertake its general duties with a view to reducing inequalities, it may have certain important actions that do not contribute to this in isolation. For instance, a community planning partnership should be able to support the development of high-skilled, high-earning employment opportunities, even though this might not, in the first step, contribute to a reduction in inequalities. Alex Rowley's amendment 1055 would require local authorities to maintain a list of community bodies who might participate in community planning. Um, while I, I've been interested in this proposal, community planning partnerships do already have access to a Scotland-wide directory of third sector organisations via the Get Involved website. They're able to access a database which provides identification of local community bodies by postal code and activity. And this information is maintained by the local third sector interface who, amongst other things, are funded to build in the third sector uh, to community planning in their local area. The database maintains, uh, includes details of community body location, website, main contact, charitable and legal status, number of paid staff, committee members, geographical reach, aims and objectives, main areas of work and financial data. It's therefore quite uh, extensive in its fields. It is not clear, therefore, what additional benefit there would be in requiring each local authority to maintain a list of community bodies in their area, nor what potentially implications there could be for a body that, for whatever reason, did not end up on the list. We do not intend to require any form of registration for community bodies to be allowed to participate in community planning. Amendment 1056 would require community planning partnerships to produce an assessment of the well-being of communities in its area. And Amendment 1059 would place a duty on them to take account of the most recently published assessment of the well-being of communities in its area before publishing its local outcomes improvement plan. The bill as introduced already requires community planning partnerships to understand the needs and circumstances of persons residing in their area. Section 5.4 of the bill requires community planning partnerships to take account of these needs and circumstances, as well as any representations received from their consultation with community bodies and others before publishing their local outcomes improvement plan. Another issue uh, with this is that there is uh, no requirement to update uh, the local uh, uh, the provisions here. Uh, Amendment 1059 refers to the most recently published assessment, but there is no duty to provide or regularly publish such assessments. Uh, a Welsh provision uh, in a parallel bill requires that there, there should be such provisions like that. Furthermore, well-being has been left purposefully undefined in uh, local government legislation, in particular the 2003 Act and its general power for local authorities to advance well-being. The introduction of a definition to the term in this Act could potentially cause confusion. So I don't believe there is any need for these amendments and all they would do would be impose a new burden on community planning partnerships. Amendment 1058 would specifically require a CPP to make all reasonable efforts to secure representations uh, from persons identified in the assessment of well-being as being considered to be particularly vulnerable or otherwise disadvantaged. But our Amendment 1022 already goes further than this, as it would require community planning partnerships when considering which community bodies are likely to be able to contribute to community planning to have particular regard to community bodies representing disadvantaged communities. The community planning partnership must, as I said, make all reasonable efforts to secure the participation of those bodies and take reasonable steps to enable community bodies who wish to participate to do so. Furthermore, under Amendment 1018, 
Community planning partnerships will also be under a duty to participate with those community bodies who wish to participate. Unlike 1058, our amendment 1022 would apply these duties of participation with community bodies in all aspects of community planning, not just the finalisation of the local outcomes improvement plan, but also review of progress against the plan, review of the continued suitability of the plan and progress reporting. They are much broader in their scope. Amendment 1057 seeks to impose a more explicit duty on CPPs to consult on the Local Outcome Improvement Plan. The Bill secures the participation of community bodies throughout the community planning process. This goes beyond preparing a plan to include the review of progress against the plan, review of continued suitability of the plan and progress reporting on that plan. This focus on ongoing participation with community bodies, including third sector bodies, distinguishes community planning from the development of other plans where consultation provides the main form, formal means of engagement with service users and stakeholders. This is about partnership. In that context, the existing provision doesn't seek to be overly prescriptive about who the CPP should consult. It's purposefully broad so that a local CPP can determine from its knowledge of local needs, circumstances and resources which community bodies it would be appropriate to consult and which other persons it would be appropriate to consult with. I believe this broad provision is more effective than this narrow specification of bodies suggested by Alex Rowley. I also note that his amendment would have community planning partnerships consult with their own partners, which seems a little unusual. Amendments 1060, 1061 and 1062 represent an attempt to bring locality planning into the bill as part of community planning. I have very considerable sympathy for the intention behind these amendments. I'm not sure that uh, there aren't other ways to achieve them rather than uh, these amendments, but I believe really really strongly in the value of neighbourhood planning. It's at this level that you really, really get the link between community planning, which can be quite strategic in its view, and the clearest example of people's well-being in local places. It's also where you can often make the biggest difference in influencing priorities for public services and how they're delivered, and also in contributing directly to the, proving the, the general well-being of a community. The community action plans, though, described in the amendments would have a, a slightly more limited purpose. It would link the local outcomes in a community planning partnership's local outcomes improvement plan with each community council area in the community planning area. The plans would set out the extent, if any, of improvement expected in that community council area uh, for each of the local outcomes set out in the local outcomes improvement plan. I want the, the purpose of locality planning to be more ambitious, broader, and really high achieving. Uh, and I want community planning partnerships to develop and apply uh, neighbourhood based approaches wherever they can offer the most value. The amendments have issues with this. To take the example of Fife, which uh, Mr Rowley will know very well, the amendments would require community planning partners to work with community councils and other community bodies to produce no fewer than 105 community action plans. That's the number of active and inactive community councils there are in Fife. That would be quite an immense bureaucracy to prescribe and would detract community planning partners and community bodies from efforts to improve outcomes where improvements were most needed, for example, targeting uh, additional work on uh, more disadvantaged areas, or indeed taking a more flexible approach in the definition of what a neighbourhood is from that of a community council area. And we need to ensure that community planning can concentrate on where it can bring the most benefits. That is improving local outcomes, reducing inequalities on a set of priorities identified from the planning, the partnership, and that local understanding. That's a key principle of the CPP provisions in this bill, and it reflects the recommendation in the Accounts Commission and Auditor General's recent national audit report, community planning, uh, turning ambition into action, that community planning partnerships should set clearer improvement priorities focused on how they will add most value as a partnership when updating their single outcome agreement. I wish to return to this in guidance, but I also think 
there is potential to work with Mr Rowley to uh, develop this, to present more technically robust and perhaps more flexibly applied amendments that he could present to Parliament at Stage 3. Uh, amendment 1029 addresses the committee's request in its Stage 1 report for confirmation that the Community Planning Partnership is required to publicly publish reports on progress. This amendment provides that community planning partnerships must publish their progress report for each reporting year. One of the principles for part two of the bill, which has attracted universal support, is the importance of community participation at the heart of community planning. 1031 imposes a new duty on community planning partnerships to account for the participation by community bodies in community planning for the area. It requires that a community planning partnership's annual report must report on the extent to which the partners have participated with community bodies during the reporting year and the extent to which that participation has been effective in enabling those community bodies to participate in community planning. I commend these government amendments to the committee and I would ask uh, Alex Rowley not to move his amendments, although as I am said, I am sympathetic to 1058 in principle. I move uh, 1021. Thank you, Minister. Can I call Alec Rowley to speak to Amendment 1055 and other amendments in the group? Mr Rowley, please. Yeah, thank you, Convener. Um, and I'm grateful to the Minister because it allows me to maybe address some of the points that he's picked up. I did note that the um, Audit Scotland 2013 Community Planning Report states that community planning takes account of a wide range of consultation activity but there is a long way to go before services are truly design, designed around communities and the potential of local people to participate in, shape and improve local services is realised. And that, I think, sums up the amendments and where, where I'm certainly trying to go today in terms of these amendments. Um, I'm prepared to to accept the Minister's point that he, he is committed, particularly in terms of looking at the, the idea of these, these local uh, community plans that are within the framework of the, the high-level plan. Um, he says that the, the, the way to do this is through guidance. I, I would say to him that to put this on the face of the bill at stage two gives us the opportunity to then work together as we get to stage three in terms of um, um, any technical difficulties or other difficulties that he envisages there. Um, but I certainly don't envisage the same difficulties. And if I can go through them, in terms of establishing a register at the local level and local authorities to maintain a register, I accept that, that, that there, there, the Minister says, what the Minister says, that there is, there is a register um, held by a third sector organisation at a national level. Um, but many of the community organisations and community groups that, that we're trying to reach, um, I suspect, aren't on any register. And that's why at the local authority level, to hold a register of all local community groups, and that can range for community councils, tenants and residents groups, um, to sport and leisure groups, it can have ranged to a whole, a whole load of different local groups that actually have an input in terms of the community planning process when you're looking at trying to uh, look at outcomes. If you take a high level outcome, for example, in terms of health and wellbeing, um, the first point I would make is that a lot of these community planning partnerships that are there tick the boxes year in and year out in terms of the outcomes that they're achieving. Um, but sometimes it's very difficult, and I did sit in a community planning partnership for something like seven, eight years and chaired the five community planning partnership for over two years. It's sometimes difficult to see what impact that's actually having in communities. And it's certainly, I think, very difficult to see how communities have been engaged or involved at all. And indeed, the majority of these community groups and organisations, uh, if you said to them, what is the community plan or how is the community plan impacting on your area? Are you involved in it? The answer would be no. And I'm sure that's the case all over Scotland. But if you take, for example, in terms of health and wellbeing, I would argue that the local bowling club the local running club, the local um, football club, um, the local kids um, activity club all have an input and should be having an input into setting what the priorities are at the local 
level. Um, the Minister, Mr Biagi, talks about 105 community action plans in Fife. I certainly am not um, in any way um, put off by that. Indeed, I would argue, if you take Fife as an example you've given, Fife has seven area committees at a local level. And some of those area committees are better than others at actually trying to get down to a more local level at the community level. If you take my own constituency, um, coming through the top side, Benarty, the second highest level of deprivation in Fife um, and, and, and a community council area, part of the Lochs Ward along with, with, with the Kelty Ward, Moan Home Village. Um, both of them are quite distinct, have distinct issues and would have priorities set locally, I'm sure, that, that while similar might be different. If you come to the bottom side of my constituency, Dalgetty Bay in Burkeed and Aberdour, Dalgetty Bay um, in Helene Community Council, again, they have priorities, but those priorities will be different in terms of the levels uh, of deprivation uh, that exists compared to the top side of the constituency. But in terms of health and wellbeing, sport, etc. So, so why would you not be able to go to that level and actually have a bottom-up approach to um, being able to set local priorities that local people and that in line that for me is in line with um, exactly what Audit Scotland are talking about. The role of community uh, community planning and creating joint working between public bodies should not be confused with the purpose of involving communities in planning their future and planning public services for their area. And, you know, the government over a number of years in establishing community planning partners was to try and get these, these public organisations to work together. And, you know, you may, you may say, well, you know, how difficult is that? But as the Minister will know, and Ministers previously, I'm sure the civil servants will know, that is often quite difficult. Even within a local authority, the, the departments and the different parts of the local authority can work in silos. We see it in government in this place. Um, and, and, and just pulling those together. But taking the next step, as, as this bill says, community empowerment, as it says on the tin, if you're going to try and achieve that community empowerment, then I would argue that by creating these registers so that all local groups can sign up to them and know that if they are signed up to them they're not going to get missed out because they're there, they're registered, they're going to be participating, they're going to be involved but secondly to allow communities at that level to start to shape what their priorities are and the services that they need because they will be different in different communities and as many groups have pointed out in the spirit of the Christie Commission um, this, 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 this fundamental change and shift in setting priorities has to take place. And if we're serious about prevention, as the Christie Commission was, then the best way to achieve that is from a local level and a bottom-up approach. And that's what these amendments actually set out to do. In terms of the well-being in local communities, it's important that, that we do uh, see what the issues are in communities because, as I say, in my own constituency, I can take you through community after community, all covered by geographical community council areas. Some have a, a, a plethora of uh, local organisations that are working away hard and should be impaired, but some don't, and some will need additional support to actually grow those organisations um, that are there. Um, but pr producing the information and the well-being on communities would be part of that. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to work with the, the Minister and with the Government um, to, 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 to firm up on any of these proposals. I certainly wouldn't want any of them to be a threat, although I don't believe they are a threat to community engagement. Quite the reverse. I think these amendments would really enhance this bill, but I'm willing, if there are specific issues there, I'm willing to work with the Minister and with the Government on that. But I do think the way to do that is to put these amendments on the face of the bill, and then let's work together. If there are difficulties, we'll iron these out as we move towards stage three. And with that, I'm happy to move, um, convener. Thank you, Mr Rowley. Uh, Stuart Stevenson, please. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. I've got a number of quite substantial difficulties with uh, what's before us uh, in Mr Rowley's uh, amendment. Um, speaking on 1055, uh, the words uh, that are before me here are each local authority must, not can, must 
for the purposes, maintain a list of all community bodies within in its area. Now, in his remarks on uh, his amendments, Mr Rowley said local groups can sign up. Now, if local groups can sign up, I'm unclear how each local authority must maintain a list, because they can only maintain a list if local groups sign up, or they can go on a search and destroy mission to try and find groups, sometimes that didn't even realise that they are groups. Now, I illustrate that in particular by the committee's visit that we made to the Backies in Aberdeen, where essentially uh, a couple of members of the community decided the grass uh, in their area between the buildings and needed, was very untidy and needed to be cut and tidied up and debris removed. And so they started to do that. Um, at some point from that initial thought that these couple of individuals had to the position we're in today, um, they acquired some funding. I think it was £500, but it was a small amount. They may have opened a bank account. They started to consider who should be on the group. The group grew, it required a formality. At what point did it become a group that each local authority must, for the purposes, maintain a list of? I don't know. And I suspect the group concerned would not know. And that is a very, very successful example of grassroots, and I know pun intended, uh, organisations starting with a little idea and developing into something that's delivering a lot. Incidentally, they didn't know what regeneration was, even though they were probably the best example that the committee found as it went around the country of regeneration actually happening. So I'm very unclear how a local community can, in effect, deliver on the must that is in the drafting in 1055. And Alec Rowley uh, specifically mentioned sport and leisure, so local golf clubs, uh, skateboarding group that may be quite informal and fluid in its structure that goes along and you use a local skateboarding park. Now, is that caught? Because it is a community body, but it hasn't got formality. It may have no group. It may have no AGM. It may have no uh, clear office. But it's sewing bees that take place in uh, the Kirk Hall. I just don't know where the line is. And it, by requiring that groups... Uh, have to be on this list, which is the implication of this amendment, we actually carry with it the risk of genuinely disempowering people who don't feel they want to get engaged with the kind of formality that this amendment says must maintain a list of all community bodies within its area. So I have serious difficulties with that. Now, 1056. Uh, 1056... Uh, would insert a community planning partnership must prepare an assessment of the state of well-being. Fair enough. Um, and then an assessment, it goes on and talks about, include an analysis of the state of well-being of any category of persons in the area whom, community, whom the community planning partnership considers to be vulnerable, otherwise disadvantaged. Well, that's a laudable aim, but it has a very practical difficulty. There are certain kinds of disadvantage that are numerically affecting <clears throat> relatively small numbers of individuals or groups, perhaps the number below which we normally suppress statistical data on, which is five. Um, there may be a single person with a health condition that creates uh, a serious disadvantage for someone, which in the drafting that there is here, that person's disadvantage would have to be reported, and that person could thereby be identified uh, by means of that report. And I think, I think there's a genuine uh, difficulty in the way uh, that is drafted. Um, minor point, 1057, um, normally resident, uh, I just make the point, it's perfectly possible in legal terms for people to be resident in more than one place. And those of us who are MSPs here who have accommodation in Edinburgh as well in, his, uh, in our constituency are an example of people who are resident in more than uh, one place. Now, 1060, um, this is in many ways even more substantial. Um, it, 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 it requires each local authority in relation to each community council area within its area. Each community council area within its area. Now, the point is, of course, that 
the defined community council areas in my constituency um, has over 30 of them, but it certainly doesn't have over 30 community councils. Because many of the areas, there is no community council. There is no prospect to be community council. Um, but it, then at 2A, the community council for the community council area, and then at paragraph uh, 5, it makes clear that the only exclusion of a community council area may be uh, if the uh, council considers that a community council is unnecessary. So an area that is defined as being for a community council but has no community council, nonetheless, the, the non-existent community council has to be consulted uh, in the way that this particular amendment is drafted. So I think we would be unwise to draw these amendments into the bill at this stage, however much sympathy we may have for the objectives, the policy objectives that underlie them. And I think the, 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 the member would be well advised to take uh, full advantage and exploit uh, the Minister and his officials uh, offer to uh, help develop uh, some of the, the ideas that Mr Riley has. I don't think this is the time uh, to bring forward these amendments, which, at least in my reading of it, appear to offer some quite substantial difficulties in certain respects. Convener. Thank you. Cameron Buchanan, please. Thank you very much. I have considerable sympathy with that because I find that the definition of well-being is too defined in 1056, that is. It's well too defined and too restrictive. And I'm mindful of what the Minister says about putting an administrative burden on this sort of thing. It's going to be quite a burden that we're going to have for this. So I'm quite um, uh, reluctant to support this because I feel that it is going to produce quite a burden on it. I'm also, I wasn't very keen on 1025 because it's putting emphasis particularly on the inequality of disadvantaged communities. And I don't, I, I'm all for that, but I think it's just putting too much emphasis on it. And my other point was, yes, on 1057, it's the residency that uh, Mr. Stevenson said. I mean, normally resident in the area, very difficult to define. And I'm very pleased to hear that the minister will, re, will consult, this, consult with this again before putting it in stage three. So I am reluctant to support it. Thank you. Uh, John Wilson, please. Thank you, Convener. And I'd like to make comment on uh, 1055. In relation to local authorities maintaining uh, lists of groups within their area, uh, I would seek from the Minister. Uh, the Minister made great play of a national register that's kept by third sector organisations. Now, I know that third sector organisations continually complain about not having enough funding. That work and that register can only be maintained if those third sector organisations at a local area have the resources to actually carry out the work to maintain a register. Uh, and taking on board Stuart Stevenson's point regarding some of the groups that aren't covered in that third sector register could be, and Mr Stevenson made reference to a sewing bee, uh, while they're not on that national register, at a local level they may be providing a valuable service for people, who, elderly and others, who take advantage of that social interaction and the activity that is generated from participating in the sewing bee. And I'm minded in my own village where there's a local group of pensioners that come together once a week to play bingo. There's only about a dozen of them that come together. They may not actually be registered, but they, as far as I'm concerned, may play a vital part in delivering elderly care services because of the communication, the interaction that takes place with those groups. It's meaningful for them, but may not actually be flagged up uh, in a national register but it's calling on local authorities to maintain that type of community register, not a register of third sector organisations or volunteer organisations that may get national funding or local funding that can easily be identified by third sector interfaces to ensure that they're on that register. In relation to the uh, other issues in terms of the community council scheme, 
And Mr Stevenson, once again, is right, and this is where I need to seek guidance from the Minister. In terms of community council schemes, I understand every local authority has a community council scheme in operation. They know the boundaries. They set the boundaries for those community councils. Unfortunately, some of the community council boundaries do not mirror what are seen as the natural boundaries of communities and the issues that have been raised by the, the examples given both by Mr Rowley and Mr Stevenson in terms of how communities view themselves and what areas they represent. But I think in relation to trying to give that boundary, give that credence to that community council boundary, is something that's already set out by local authorities. But we may have to look at that to find out whether or not community councils naturally cover and encompass community organisations and areas where the community council is much larger than the areas where real deprivation exists. And we do not target resources through the community planning partnerships to the areas of multiple deprivation. And it's, I think this is a work in progress. And I welcome the Minister's uh, acceptance that the, to, for stage three that could work together with Alec Rowley to ensure we get something in legislation that actually encompasses what we're trying to achieve here. And I think the bottom line for everybody around this uh, table and in the Parliament is to achieve the goal of ensuring that the policies, the practice and the delivery of community planning partnerships are best suited to those local communities that need the most help. And, that we can, and unfortunately, I've no community planning partnerships have been around now for over 30 years. And I know that in many cases, we're still struggling to actually get that, uh, the resources necessary to the communities that are most in need of those resources. And we need to hopefully get a piece of legislation in place that can achieve the best outcomes for those communities and for the nation as a whole. Thank you. Um, I recognise that this is the um, first stage two that many members uh, have, uh, have undertaken. Um, I, 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 I should say that you are able to intervene in other members during the course of their speeches at, at, at this stage two. Um, and it would not be the norm for me to take back members who have already spoken. But under the circumstances, I'm going to allow Cameron Buchanan to come back very briefly, and the same uh, for uh, Mr Rowley. Cameron Buchanan. Thank you very much, Convener. It, my, my point really was on 1025, putting, no, sorry, on 1055, it's that each CCP must maintain a list of all community bodies in this area. It's the word must, I think, rather than should, I would because I think it is quite a burden to have it. And I think the point that Mr Wilson has made about things like the bowling club and a bingo thing is too restrictive. And that's what I'd like to say. Thank you. Alec Rowley, please. Convener, I mean, just to, for, and I'm grateful for allowing me to come back, just to clarify that the local authority must maintain the register. That does not mean that the local, the local zone group or the local um, skateboard group must sign up to the register. The point is that every local authority maintains that register and people sign up to the register, organisations, groups sign up to the register so that they're registered and they will then be guaranteed to be involved in the consultations that take place. Um, now, if if Mr Stevenson is right, that, that suggests that local groups would be forced to sign up. And I don't think it does, but that would be a technicality, the drafting of this. this, this, this yep. um, I'm, I'm really just trying to make the, the point that groups might feel that they should be when groups are very often Free, free spirits who really want to have nothing whatsoever to do with the formal structures of government at any level. And I, I, I just wonder if the member uh, thinks also that just the phrasing that he's adopted appears to suggest that local authorities must list all the groups, regardless of whether the groups wish to be listed or not. Because that is the works that are being put in the bill of the amendments passed. But, Mr Riley. But, but what I'm saying is if you establish a principle, if, if there is a technical issue with the draft, then that can be picked up at stage three. But the principle is that local authorities hold the register. What it means is that I would hope that, that local groups would be encouraged to actually register because more and more local groups would want to be involved in setting the local priorities through the local plans. And that's the crucial bit, is that, that for the, the next phases of that, 
is that locally, local groups are much more involved in setting the, the, the local plans. Likewise, with the, with, with the um, with Cameron Buchanan's comment about the administrative burden um, that would be placed on local authorities, I would just stress that all that information um, in terms of well-being, all that information is available within every local authority um, across Scotland. The question is whether you make that information available for each local area and you do it in such a way that it's transparent that will influence the discussion and engage more people at a community level to be able to set out their priorities. So in, in terms of it being an administrative burden, I don't think it's a burden, it's already there. Indeed, you really would argue that if community planning partners were um, going about their business and setting their priorities for local communities in the correct way, they would be taking account of all that information in doing so. What this does is it informs um, and empowers communities with the same level of information so that you can then start to make the case at a local level for what the priorities are for your community. And that, that, that really, that, 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 that would be the purpose Everything. here. Thank you, Convener. Okay, Mr. Wilson, very briefly. I, I'm sorry, Convener, I, I, I was trying to intervene in Mr. Rowley. My apologies for this, but maybe the Minister can help us out with this. I know what the amendment says in terms of 155, and I've, I've heard what Mr. Rowley said about community organisations, if they so wished, would, could be uh, or refused to be uh, on that register of local authorities. I'm slightly confused because what I would like local authorities to be aware of is, and I mentioned earlier, the bingo group, the sewing bee, I would like local authorities to be aware of those community organisations' existence uh, so that they could actually then consult with them. But I'm rather concerned at the issue about community organisations being able to deregister themselves mm. in, in some respect from the council's uh, list. And what I'm trying to get to is a point where we, then talking about the parliament, the government, local authorities and communities fully understand what organisations exist in an area and what services they are delivering within that area. And it may not be statutory services, but uh, what I'm frightened of is the duplication that may take place when a health board or a local authority decide we're going to provide social care services for the elderly, which are already being delivered at a local level by a local community group. And that's where I, would, I, I agree with the 055, but I'm rather concerned now with Mr Rowley's insistent, uh, insistence that groups could deregister themselves and not be on that list. And uh, I've got a fear there that we could end up uh, failing to understand what's happening at a local level and being delivered by communities at a local level if they're not on the, any list. Okay, thank you. Minister, could you wind up, please? Thank you. I've been patiently waiting rather than intervening uh, because I, I knew I had this chance. I would just go through the, the four issues that have been broadly the, the subject of debate. The one that has been the subject of least was Cameron Buchanan's uh, challenging of Amendment 1025. But that does come from the committee's recommendation that there should be a specific duty on CPP partners to reduce inequality and focus on prevention. And... Uh, I know he has been skewered on what he has signed up to in committee in the past uh, and only to oppose at a later date. And I, I, I simply want to move on by saying that I believe that the committee um, would recognise that va the value of that and endorse it. Um, on the, the other issues, the amendments from Mr Rowley, on the register and 1055, there are technical issues here, but there is also an issue of principle. Now, the technical issues you have to look at this amendment and say that each local authority must maintain a list of all community bodies within its area. That, as well as placing a burden on local authorities, to me, um, suggests that it wouldn't be possible to deregister if you fitted the definition of a community body. You would have to be on that, and the local authority would be under a duty to, to require you to, to register or to try and make you register. I also think in practice there would be a danger if it was in statute like that, that that becomes an authoritative list, and anybody who for whatever reason wasn't on it 
could be uh, excluded by people that say, well, well, you, you've not participated in the, the list process. And it's also important to remember that we had amendments earlier that removed inadvertent duties that the bill had placed on community bodies because the purpose here is to place duties on the statutory bodies, local authorities and so on, uh, rather than the voluntary sector and the informal voluntary sector that makes up uh, so much of, of what happens at the, the grassroots level and which we've been referring to as, as sewing bees and so on. But the principal difficulty here is that it's a duplication of something that already happens. Now, the term national register has been used, but what we actually have is a network of local registers that covers the entire nation. And these are done uh, through the third sector interfaces. And there is funding from the Scottish Government to do this. The total number of organisations on these collectively is 35,000. But we know that 12,500 of these are not registered charities. Now, I haven't looked at that in great detail, but that strikes me as being the mother and toddler groups, the small informal groups. Yes. Minister, you've just said there's 35,000 registered organisations yes. on this national register. Can I seek clarification? My understanding, and I'm sit corrected if I'm wrong with this figure, but my understanding is SCVO has a membership of, and claim to have a membership of 55,000. Uh, if FC, SCVO has a membership of 55,000, and you're saying on this register there's 35,000, then where's the other 20,000? And on top of that, the, the register, and, and I know the register, omits certain very low uh, very active community organisations. So, in terms of your 35,000, then where, how do we gather the information mm. on all those other community organisations that are working away day and daily, delivering services in the local communities which are not on that national register? Yes, sir. I can't speak for the membership of SCVO. We will look at that. But the, the real question here is that if there are organisations out there, and there's, there's 12,500 groups on this list that aren't formally registered charities, that must be the informal sector. Is it going to be larger if it's being, is it going to be more comprehensive if it's being run by local authorities rather than the third sector interface? And I'm, I'm not convinced that that's the case. I, I'm also wondering what the, the approach is, what the justification is for moving this from the third sector itself and you know, in Edinburgh, the, the local third sector interface is the, the uh, Edinburgh Voluntary Sector Council, the Social Enterprise Network. These groups that are grassroots, bottom up, that are supposed to be there and constituted for um, the whole range of organisations to the local authority. And I'm also not clear as to the justification for moving what is essentially being done by the third sector itself to uh, the local authority rather than the CPP, for example. The CPP could in statute be given this rather than local authorities, and that would create a list that would uh, flow through to all the partners. Yeah. However, the, the, the principle is to try and establish a much more localised list that encourages local organisations to get involved in the process of community planning, and particularly in terms of setting priorities and outcomes at a very local level. And that, that, that is, does the Minister accept that that's what isn't happening under the current community planning regime that is in place? Minister. The third sector interfaces exist to be the, the interface between the community planning partnership and the, the third sector in their area and reaching all the way down to your informal um, pensioners' lunches and, and so on. Now, I agree with the principle, the objective that we want all of these organisations to be able to participate in community planning. I went along to a pensioner's lunch and I found out new things about parking in the local area that I then took up with the council. You know, that sort of grassroots, ordinary people, day in, day out, ordinary lives being consulted and finding out and, and therefore informing action is the kind of thing we want to encourage. But if there is an issue with the TSIs in reaching all of these people, is the solution moving it to local authority control and creating a duty there. I, I, I don't see that that is the answer to the question that is being asked here. And I would also expect that in the event of duplication with TSIs being funded to uh, deliver 
such a such a network of, of local databases which are for the local authority area and councils gaining a statutory responsibility to that the funding that we give to third sector interfaces would come under pressure from local authorities who would say well it's more appropriate given that we now have the statutory responsibility that you fund us and I think these are these are big questions that we while we may have sympathy with the principle of involving the third sector putting this into the bill even for subsequent amendment is something I would resist very strongly. Mr Stevenson. Um, would the Minister also recognise that of course community groups are quite indifferent to council boundaries and will straddle them possibly two or three? Minister. That is indeed another uh, good point and uh, another issue as to why putting the, the, place, the responsibility on local authorities wouldn't uh, in principle be appropriate. To move on to the other two points, uh, to the next of the, the other two points of contention, the issue of um, well-being and the, the well-being assessment. The bill already requires that the community planning partnership uh, must take account of, quote, the needs and circumstances of persons residing in the area of the local authority to which the plan relates. Uh, that is uh, 5.4b. Now, that would require them to assess, to, to be aware. That is pretty implicit. But more importantly, that applies to all the functions of uh, the, uh, and all of the, the details, all of the, the things that a CPP would do, rather than simply being uh, narrow. We're also, uh, I would also point out that the representations that have to be secured, the from community bodies will also assist in that assessment. That is essentially an assessment if community bodies must be um, supported to make representations and you have to understand the needs and circumstances, that is there, but it is much broader and it covers all the, the functions. And I, I remain of the view that it is potentially difficult to introduce a definition of well-being in this Act when we have not introduced it in others. And lastly, on the issue of localities, whenever I've gone around Scotland visiting local authorities, I've been really impressed by what happens when you replicate a CPP <coughs> at a lower level, when you take all of the statutory bodies, all the voluntary groups, the council, and have them meet and plan at a more localised level. Uh, but everybody does it slightly differently. Everybody has slightly different people around the table, slightly different lines of accountability, slightly um, different amounts of money being dealt with at that level. Even within Dundee, they have eight uh, local uh, ward level decision making bodies. Six of them have a budget of 125,000, two of them don't, and that's because those are uh, community regeneration forums in areas that need regeneration and a bit of extra effort. I worry that the detail of this is quite prescriptive in focusing on community council boundaries rather than others, and that if it is spread out, requiring all of those community council boundaries to have a local plan, rather than creating a flexibility whereby you may have a, a ward level plan and then a, some additional top up actions at local level, you would potentially empower the already empowered, which has been an issue that's been put out by the committee. But as I said, I will only speak warmly about locality planning, and I think it should be taken forward, and I have that offer. I'll take an intervention. Mr Riley. I'm very, I'm very pleased that, that, that the principle of this you seem to be, be supportive of. Now, would you accept that what I'm not trying to do here is create a large bureaucracy of, of, of government officials at the local level, or health officials, or sitting around tables in every locality, trying to come up with what their view is. That's, that's, that's the problem, and that's been the problem with government and community planning, and is, is, is the professionals telling the communities what's good for them. I'm trying to change the opposite of that, exactly to what it says on the tin, community empowerment and community planning, so that communities set their priorities and they set the agenda that the public bodies and others then have to work to, and they hold to account those public bodies to deliver on the outcomes that have been set locally and the priorities that have been set locally. We've got to reverse this professionalism within the public services where they tell communities what's good for them, and that's the principle that I was trying to establish here, but I um, welcome the fact that, that the Minister uh, supports the principle and I'm sure um, we can work together on that. Minister? I don't think there's a single word that Mr Rowley just said that I disagreed with. And uh, 
that agreement on principle is a good foundation to, to go forward on this area. Thank you very much. Uh, that was a, a long section over those amendments, but I think that was very worthwhile. The question is that Amendment 1021 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Can I call Amendments 1022, 1023 and 1024, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated? Uh, Minister, could you move those uh, Amendments 1022 to 1024 on block? Moved on block. Thank you. Uh, do any members have uh, objections to a single question being put in those amendments? Yes, I object to 1025. We're not dealing with 1025. Oh, We're dealing with 1022 to 1024. Are there any, any objections to those being moved on block? No. Uh, can we... Uh, the question is then that amendments 1022 to 1024 uh, are agreed. Are we all agreed? Thank you very much. Uh, can I call Amendment 1055 in the name of Alec Rowley, already debated with Amendment 1021. Mr Rowley, to move or not move? Convener, in light of the discussion and the commitment for the Minister, I don't intend to move any of the, the amendments in this section. I intend to work with the Minister to try and take them forward for Stage 3. OK, I will do them one by one. Okay. Um, so not so move. Uh, so not move. Are the committee content with that? Thank you. Uh, can I call... Oh, sorry. The question is that section 4 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Can I call amendment 1026 in the name of the minister? Already debated with amendment 1015. Minister, would you like to move formally, please? Moved. Uh, the question is that amendment 126 be agreed to. Are we all Agreed. agreed. Thank you. The question is that Schedule 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Uh, can I call Amendment 1025 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 1021. Minister, could you formally move, please? Moved. Uh, the question is that Amendment 1025 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Uh, no. No, we're not all agreed. Uh, therefore, there will be a vote. Uh, those voting for the amendment, please raise your hands now. And those against the amendment, please show. I've got to get the official sheet, folks. Um, uh, those in favour of the amendment, six. Those against, one. The question is agreed to. Um, can I call Amendment 1056 in the name of Alec Rowley, already debated with Amendment 1021. Mr Rowley, to move or not move? Not move, convener. Uh, are the committee content that that's not moved? Okay, thank you. The question is that Amendment 1056 be agreed no, no, to... No, 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 it's not. It's just it's not moved. Sorry, it's not moved. I beg your pardon. We're at that stage, folks. <laughs> Uh, can I call Amendment 1027 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 1015? Minister, to move formally, please. Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 1027 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Call Amendment 1028 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 1015. Minister, would you like to move formally, please? Moved. The question is that Amendment 1028 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Can I call Amendment 1057 in the name of uh, Alec Rowley, uh, already debated with Amendment 1021. Mr Rowley, to move or not move? Not move, convener. Thank you. Are the committee con content with that? Yeah, Thank you. Uh, can I call Amendment 1058 in the name of Alec Rowley, already debated with Amendment 1021. Mr Rowley, to move or not move? Not move, convener. Thank you. Are the committee content with that? Thank you. Can I call Amendment 1059 in the name of Alec Rowley, already debated with Amendment 1021. Mr Rowley, to move or not move? Not move. Thank you. Are the committee content with that? Thank you. Um, the question is that Section 5 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Uh, can I call Amendment 1060 in the name of Alec Rowley, already debated with Amendment 1021. Mr Rowley, to move or not move? Yeah, not move, convener. Are the committee content? Yeah. Thank you. 
Uh, can I call Amendment 1061 in the name of Alec Rowley, already debated with Amendment 1021. Mr Rowley, to move or not move? They not move. Thank you. Committee content with that? Yes. Thank you. The question is that Section 6 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Can I call amendments 1029, 1030 and 1031, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated? Uh, Minister, would you like to move amendments 1029 to 1031 on block? Moved on block. Thank you. Uh, does any member object to a single question being put on amendments 1029 to 1031? Uh, in which case, the question is that amendments 1029 to 1031 are agreed. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Can I call Amendment uh, 1062 in the name of Alec Rowley, already debated with Amendment 1021. Alec Rowley, to move or not move? Do not move. Are the committee content with that? Yes. Thank you. Um, the, the question is that Section 7 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Uh, can I call Amendment 1032 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 1015. Minister, formally move, please. Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 1032 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. The question is that Section 8 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I think at that point, folks, it might be wise to have a wee comfort break. Mm -hmm. Um, so can we break for a, a few minutes? Um, thank you. I suspend.
Okay, thank you. We now move on to Group 7, Extent of Duty on Community Planning Partners to Contribute Resources. Can I call Amendment 1063 in the name of Cameron Buchanan and a group in its own. Cameron Buchanan to move and speak to the amendment, please. Thank you very much, convener. I would like to uh, leave out the word securing and put, select inviting, because I think it is less restrictive and less prescriptive. Thank you, Minister. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Could you move it, please, Mr. Yes, Buchanan? Thank sorry. Thank you very much. I, move, I will therefore move my amendment. Okay. okay. Uh, Minister, please. That's uh, a relatively uh, sketchy endorsement of the, the reasons behind it, but the, the reasons behind what we have at the moment are that we're keen to ensure that community bodies, uh, which the CPP considers are likely to be able to contribute to community planning, are supported uh, to participate to the extent that they wish to. Now, the section in question, uh, although it uses the word securing, it refers back to an earlier section which is very clear that a uh, community planning partnership must consider which community bodies are likely to be able to contribute, make all reasonable efforts to secure the participation of such community bodies. I note secure wasn't amended in the earlier instance, and to the extent uh, that such community bodies wish to participate in community planning, take such steps as are reasonable to enable the community bodies to participate in community planning. Now, that, that is the spirit of this section, so that um, each community planning partner has to contribute funds, staff and other resources that the CPP considers appropriate to assist to secure the participation of those bodies that wish to uh, participate in community planning. A duty to simply uh, invite will not ensure that a community uh, body which is invited to participate will be supported uh, to do so and that's why we think it is important to have a duty to contribute resources to secure participation and I would ask Cameron Buchanan to withdraw the amendment. Thank you Minister. Cameron Buchanan to wind up and press her withdraw please. Uh, in review of what the Minister says I will withdraw the amendment. Uh, are the committee content with that? Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, the question is now that section 9 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Uh, if we can move on to section 10, group 8, community planning status of guidance. Uh, can I call amendment 1033 in the name of the minister, grouped with amendments 1064, 1065, 1034, 1066 and 1067. Uh, can I point out that amendments 1033 and 1064 are direct alternatives and that amendments 1034 and 1066 are also direct alternatives? Minister, can I ask you to move amendment 1033 and speak to all amendments in the group, please? Thanks, uh, convener. Uh, section 10, 1 and 2 of the bill uh, currently provides that community planning partnerships and partners must comply with any guidance issued by Scottish ministers. All of these amendments seek to adjust that wording slightly. The government amendments in my name address the concerns that were raised by the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee about the term comply. The committee queried why guidance should be uh, binding in the absence of provision for parliamentary scrutiny. The government's response to that report noted this concern and undertook to bring forward an amendment. Amendments 1033 and 1034 provide that community planning partnerships and pl partners are under a duty to have regard to guidance rather than a duty to comply with it. This reflects the usual wording used in legislation in relation to guidance, is consistent with references elsewhere in the bill and will uh, keep the DPLR committee happy. Um, more broadly, I hope, I recognise the concerns that the committee has raised over complex legal language. And well, I, I will have to prejudge what Cameron Buchanan intends to say. If his attempt was to simplify the language of the bill, we have used the term have regard to for the reasons I set out before, because it is the term which is generally used. It's well understood by the courts. There's substantial case law setting out how it is to be interpreted requires a person not necessarily to follow guidance to the letter, but to be aware of it and to have uh, justifiable reasons for any departure from it. If we were to use the term consider, there would be uncertainty about its, meeting, about its meaning and the duty it imposes. 
Uh, Drew Smith's amendments would change the wording to refer to statutory guidance. Again, I haven't heard from the member, but it is not usual practice to refer to guidance uh, issued in pursuance of legislative provision as statutory guidance, and certainly not in an act. Officials have run an initial electronic search of legislation and haven't found any references to statutory guidance as a term in primary legislation. Statutory guidance may well be how we refer to guidance that is mentioned in statute but it is not a, a term that is commonplace in primary legislation itself. I would therefore ask Cameron Buchanan and Drew Smith not to move these amendments uh, for members to back the, the government amendments, which do uh, much the same and keep the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee happy. And I move Amendment 1033. Thank you, Minister. Can I call Cameron Buchanan to speak to Amendment 1064 and other amendments in the group? Mr Buchanan, please. Thank you very much. I would refer back to 106A when I had the same sort of wording and I really wanted less restrictive movements on it, which is why I felt that uh, have regard to was better with com than comply. So I would like to press that amendment if I could. Thank you. Thank you. Can I call on uh, Drew Smith to speak to Amendment 1065 and other amendments in the group? Uh, thank you very much, um, convener. Um, I think there is a difference between statutory guidance and advisory guidance. Although, I mean, I know what the minister says about uh, uh, whether the term is, is used in the bill, and I just reflect it's uh, often interesting that uh, when government uses precedent um, as an argument, uh, both for and against things uh, from time to from time to time. Um, I, I, I'm only going to speak briefly, uh, Mr. Stevenson. So I would uh, propose just to conclude by saying um, I, I think there is a difference between. Uh, leaving, uh, allowing local partners to attach the appropriate weight to different kinds of guidance uh, that's available. I think the Minister's uh, attempt to do that with inserting the words uh, have regard to um, does address the issue, and given that I was arguing that have, a rega have regard to was a better alternative earlier uh, in the Stage 2 debate, I'm happy to, to join the, to, to, to indicate when appropriate uh, convener that I won't press the amendment. Thank you. Um, I, I will call you later for that. Uh, Stuart Stevenson, please. Um, I just invite the Minister, if he can, to identify what uh, instruments would be excluded by the qualification of the word, with the word statutory uh, that Drew Smith seeks to introduce to the legislation. Because clearly, if you're uh, describing a particular category, which is statutory, you are by definition include, excluding others. And I wonder if the Minister is in a position to describe what instruments would be excluded by using the word statutory. Uh, Minister, it's now to, your turn to, to wind up. Uh, wish you well with answering Mr Stevenson's question. <laughs> it has to be said this uh, amendment led to a considerable collective scratching of heads because the Scottish Ministers have, by statute, a general guidance-making power. Therefore, you could argue that any guidance we issue under a general <laughs> under a statute giving us a general guidance power would be uh, statutory guidance. So I'm not clear uh, myself that there would be uh, a distinction there that, that it would have much of an effect. But I, I welcome Drew Smith's um, position there. Yes, of course, always. Uh, Mr Stevenson. Uh, but nonetheless, yes, uh, Minister, uh, adding an, an adjective to before a noun uh, would, if it has any effect, be an effect to restrict what is described to only those to which an adjective can apply and not include those to which that adjective would not apply. Yes. Minister. Yes, although one could say that the adjective all would not be in any way restrictive, even though it would add an adjective before the, the, the term. And I think uh, in, uh, in this case that might be an appropriate parallel. We do have basically an, an agreement that what matters here is uh, the importance that must be attached to guidance. So we have three options. We have what is in the bill unamended, which is must comply with. We've got the government position of have regard to, and we've got uh, Cameron Buchanan's uh, suggestion of consider. I, I think have regard to strikes the best balance and is uh, in accord with the general expectations of uh, the treatment of guidance in law. Thank you, Minister. The question is that Amendment 1033 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Uh, can I call Amendment 1064 in the name of Cameron Buchanan, already debated with Amendment 1033. Uh, Mr Buchanan, to move or not move? Moved. Um, are we uh, all agreed? No. Uh, we are not agreed, and there will be a vote. Those voting for the amendment, please raise their hands now. 
And the, those against the amendment, please show. Thank you. Those for, one. Those against, six. The question is disagreed to. Um, I now call Amendment 1065 in the name of Drew Smith, already debated with Amendment 1033. Mr Smith, to move or not move? Not move. Are the committee content? Yes. Thank you. Can I call Amendment 1034 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 1033? Minister, formally move, please. Moved. The question is that Amendment 1034 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Can I call Amendment 1066 in the name of Cameron Buchanan, already debated with Amendment 1033? Mr Buchanan, to move or not move? Not moved. Uh, are the committee content? Yes. Thank you. Can I call Amendment 1067 in the name of Drew Smith, already debated with Amendment 1033? Mr Smith, to move or not move? Uh, convener, can I seek the committee's agreement not to move? Uh, thank you for your welcome and wish you well with the rest of Stage 2 proceedings. Thank you very much, Mr Smith. Are the committee comment, uh, content yes. even? Thank you. Uh, the question is that Section 10 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that Section 11 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We move on to uh, Section 12, Establishment of Corporate Bodies. Can I call Amendment 1035 in the name of the Minister, grouped with Amendments 1036 and 1038? Uh, Minister, to move Amendment 1035 and speak to all amendments in the group, please. Thank you, Convener. These amendments in this group relate to the establishment of a corporate body for community planning purposes. Under Section 19 of the Local Government in Scotland Act 2003, the Scottish Ministers may, on the application of a local authority together with one or more of the bodies, office holders and other persons participating in community planning, establish by order a body corporate for community planning purposes. Section 12 of the Bill also provides for the establishment of a body corporate for community planning purposes and has the same application requirements, i.e. an application must be made by the local authority for the area and at least one other community planning partner. That application reflects how responsibility for community planning has applied until now, with the relevant local authority being under a statutory duty to initiate, facilitate and maintain community planning. Now, this is no longer the case under the Bill. Section 8.2 applies duties of governance, that is, to facilitate community planning and take reasonable steps to ensure CPPs carry out their functions effectively and efficiently on a number of community planning partners rather than simply local authorities. These include the Local Health Board, Scottish Enterprise, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, the Chief Constable of Police Scotland, the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, as well as the local authority for the area. We propose Amendment 1035 so that an application to establish a corporate body for community planning purposes would only be valid if made jointly by all of the governance partners listed in Section 8.2. This amendment reflects that all the governance partners listed in Section 8.2 are collectively responsible for the effective governance of the CPP. The original purpose of allowing corporate bodies to be formed was for them to coordinate or further community planning, not as a corporate body that substantially delivers services in itself. However, since the bill was introduced, we've noted representations, including those from the Chair of the Accounts Commission in his evidence to the Public Audit Committee on 3rd of December, which suggest possible value for a community planning partnership to be established as a corporate body which would deliver services directly. Now, whilst we don't know of any CPP that wishes to establish a corporate body, this amendment makes it clear that such incorporation could proceed for the purposes of delivering services. Clearly, in any such scenario, a community planning partnership which wished to establish itself as a corporate body would have to demonstrate the merits of this conversion before the Scottish Ministers would lay draft regulations before Parliament and indeed before the Parliament would approve the draft regulations giving effect to any such change. 
Amendment 1036 will remove the words, including in particular its conduct and coordination from Section 12.1, with a view to clarifying that the community planning functions of a corporate body could be wider than that. Whilst there has been continued background interest in the possibility of establishing CPPs as incorporated bodies, there has to date never been a firm proposal, nor are we aware of any proposed applications for incorporation down the line. Um, the effect of Cameron Buchanan's Amendment 1068 is that another enactment or rule of law could prevent a body established by regulation from carrying out a function set out in the regulation, uh, regulations. The legislation as is acts as a safeguard to support the carrying out of functions by any new corporate body so that uh, uh, by the body so that a new and yet to be established corporate body could carry out community planning functions. If such an application were received, this would be subject to ministerial approval and parliamentary scrutiny, which would include consideration of all matters referred to in section 12, including what functions such a body would have. I don't think it is helpful to restrict the operation of that section by removing subsection 4b. I therefore invite Cameron Buchanan not to move his amendment and I ask the committee to support amendments 1035 and 1036 and I move amendment 1035. Thank you, Minister. Cameron Buchanan to speak to amendment 1068 and other amendments in the group, please. We'll withdraw. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, you, uh, we can do that at the appropriate time, but you don't yeah. want to, want to no, speak at this reason. moment in time. Um, any other members? No? Good. Uh, Mr. Wilson. I'm sorry about this. Just, I'm just trying to seek clarification uh, from the Minister. You indicated at the present moment that there has been no approach by a community planning partnership to establish a corporate body. Uh, and I'm just wondering why he feels it's appropriate at this time to put this in the legislation if there was an approach by a community planning partnership or two partners within that community planning partnership to set up a corporate body, then there would need to be further uh, legislation laid before Parliament to allow that to happen. Would it not have been more appropriate to leave this section out at the present time until such a time we were confident that a corporate body was the best way to take forward community planning partnerships? Um, uh, before I ask you to wind up, uh, my understanding, Minister, that there's only one community planning partnership that's ever really looked um, at incorporation and decided not to do so. Um, I, I don't know if I'm correct in, in that assumption or, or, or not. Um, it is the case that that's currently in legislation. Um, uh, why um, does it, is it necessary to, to leave it in, do you feel, even though nobody has made that application, as Mr Wilson says? Minister. There is an issue here that this power exists at the moment under the 2003 Act and there is obviously a, a choice there as to whether to get rid of that power from primary legislation or to update it so that it remains an option that can be under consideration. Now, we, we consider that this is something that has been uh, debated in the past. We don't necessarily see any reason to move away from the, the purpose of having that as an option there. And it has been said that, uh, as, I, as I pointed out by the, uh, the, the chair of the Accounts Commission, that there might be value in this. So to keep the option open in primary legislation, update it to the new governance landscape, but to require secondary legislation for, for implementation would seem to us to be a, a balanced approach and I would happily take intervention. Sure. I understand where the Audit Commission may be coming from in terms of setting up incorporated bodies, uh, but my concern would be, given that, that it wouldn't be the community planning partnership as a whole would be that incorporated body, or potentially not the community planning partnership as a whole would be that incorporated body. Mm. What we've actually got here is that two or more partners may decide to become a, a corporate body uh, in relation to delivering services that potentially may be being delivered by other community planning partners within that community planning partnership. And it's that issue about where the division takes place between the corporate body with two or maybe more partners and the community planning partnership. Uh, and would the minister not envisage some potential conflict 
between the status of the corporate body versus the status of the community planning partnership? Minister. Just to clarify this, the existing 2003 power was a local authority in partnership with another, so that would be two participants. That so, sorry, Minister, I'm not disagreeing with you. Yeah. The problem is, is that that doesn't mean, make the 2003 legislation no, no, right. But what, what, I'm, what I was just about to say was that was the 2003 Act. This yeah. provision would require all to participate and to, to jointly apply. So this wouldn't be an issue like the 2003 Act, where there were two organisations, one of them the local yeah. authority. This would be a joint application by all uh, community uh, planning partnership governance partners. So they would have to be content and collectively agreeing to that, which would remove the, the prospect of, of two creating something that would cause uh, difficulties with the other. This is to open, the, uh, to leave the option open for a CPP collectively to come together and argue that it, uh, and make a case to, uh, for corporate body status and leave that option open subject to parliamentary scrutiny should they wish to take that option, option up. Thank you, Minister. Uh, the question is that Amendment 1035 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Uh, can I call Amendment 1036 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 1035. Minister, could you formally move, please? Moved. Uh, the question is that Amendment 1036 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Uh, can I call Amendment 1068 in the name of Cameron Buchanan, already debated with Amendment 1035. Mr Buchanan, to move or not move? Not moved. Uh, are the committee content? Yes. Thank you. Uh, the question is that section 12 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Uh, can I call amendment 1037 in the name of the minister, already debated with amendment 1015. Minister, to move formally, please. Moved. Thank you. The question is that amendment 1037 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. The question is that section 13 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Uh, can I call uh, Amendment 1069 in the name of Alec Rowley, grouped with Amendment 1070? Uh, Alec Rowley, to move Amendment 1069 and speak to both amendments in the group, please. I thank you, Convener. Um, I'm happy to move Amendment 1069 and speak to the amendments within the group. Um, the purpose of the amendment is to ensure that there is consistency in the application of community engagement standards across Scotland without compromising the development of standards to take account of local circumstances. There is much good practice in the public sector when it comes to consultation with communities. However, this practice is not always of a consistently high standard. To genuinely involve communities in the design of public services, the high quality involvement of communities in local decision making must um, become second nature to public services as well as being part of their everyday core purpose. The amendments tabled by me will mean that placing the national standards for community engagement on a statutory basis um, will ensure that during the development of the National Outcomes Part 1 and Local Outcome Improvement Plans Part 2, best practice and community engagement is adhered to. Um, concern has been expressed that by placing the national standards for community engagement in statute, that this would limit the development of standards at the local level and public bodies would be hampered in developing participative techniques to fit local structures, the amendments as they stand would not have this effect. It should be possible for public bodies to use a range of participative techniques, but in certain circumstances be required to apply the national standards for community engagement. In particular, community planning partners should have um, to follow the standards for community engagement when engaging with communities to draw up local outcome improvement plans. Um, so with that, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, asking for support from the committee for these amendments. Okay, and you move, yeah. yeah um, Stuart Stevenson, please. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. Uh, right at the very end of his remarks, Alec uh, Rowley uh, used the phrase local improvement outcomes. And I think that goes to the very heart of this, that, that we're focusing here on processes which carry with them the very real danger of removing 
or for community bodies appearing to remove uh, flexibility in how they undertake uh, the tasks that they, they, they undertake. And indeed, inhibiting the development of new and innovative ways uh, of engaging with communities. Because at the end of the day, this is all, in a sense, noises off to communities. What actually matters is the outcomes and the sense of empowerment that communities uh, gain from the passage of this legislation and everything that flows from it. And so I'm pretty uncomfortable uh, with the idea that we should make this statutory, require everybody to step up to the mark, rather than, as I would prefer to see, uh, local communities working out for themselves and therefore having ownership of and commitment to uh, what they want to do. A standard, yes, that relates to outcomes, by all means, but are standards that relate to processes. Uh, even if the government's in favour of it, I would still be doubtful. Minister, please. Well, I agree very much with the intention behind this amendment, and I recognise we all want to make the public sector engage efficiently and effectively with the public and communities across Scotland. And we know that local government and other public bodies are increasingly using a really impressive range of community engagement activities to consult people and offer opportunities to participate on activities, plans and service uh, delivery. But we also know that the range and degree of participation can vary considerably. And while the National Standards for Community Engagement provides a good practice model for both formal and informal community engagement, its use over time has been patchy. However, um, I, I believe there are better ways than this amendment to secure the objective that we share here. Now, a great deal of impact can be realised through the use of guidance, which is much more adaptable and flexible. For example, in the Stage 1 debate, I highlighted that the National Standards for Community Engagement predate the mass use of social media in this country, something that is very important for any kind of community outreach and engagement. And uh, we know from... Uh, earlier discussions, section uh, 10, which we have just amended, local authorities, community planning partners and public service authorities will be required to have uh, regard to guidance in exercising their functions. And I would repeat the uh, commitments made by my predecessor, Derek Mackay, that we are going to take the national standards for community engagement, specify them as part of that guidance and update and refresh them to reflect the new context. I also believe that if we were to lay regulations, as the amendment suggests, we would have to provide further supplementary guidance on that anyway to exemplify what good practice would look like and how it should be uh, applied to uh, use a, to borrow a phrase from the local government committee's uh, earlier statements, take the gobbledygook of the Act and translate it into something that people working at the coalface um, would use. So there will need to be guidance uh, either way. I would also be concerned about embedding one term here, which is community engagement in meetings with stakeholders uh, over the last few months. Some have suggested that community participation or community empowerment might be a better term for the refreshed standards. And if we put this in statute at the moment, we will maintain one model. The new context that we are trying to develop with stakeholder organisations and with the public sector, it shouldn't be underestimated. This bill will change, as its entirety, the landscape of participation and uh, engagement. It will make clear, as if any kind of clarity was needed, that community bodies have a right to participate in the decisions that affect them and that public authorities have a duty to respond to that. I expect public authorities to be looking for guidance uh, to help them do that. And as good practice continues to evolve, that the guidance that accompanies the bill will need to change and keep up. Secondary legislation is not the best way uh, to do this. I accept, though, that there may well be space in the bill where we can improve it further to ensure greater participation from the public and communities across Scotland in the activities of public bodies and local authorities. That could be a much broader power than this one that is specified to promote and facilitate participation across the board in all activities of a very wide range of bodies. And in order to have that broad impact, I would expect or intend any such amendments to come forward later in the bill rather than to focus 
on CPPs. I, I would note as well that the amendment refers only to the CPP partners engaged in governance under Section 8, not to all partners as listed in Schedule 1. And I would also expect the national standards to be, for example, considered by local authorities in their consultations on common good. As I said before, I agree with the intention behind this amendment, but I think there is a better way to achieve its aims. I would ask uh, Mr Rowley to withdraw uh, Amendment 1069, not to move Amendment 1070, and if, after the conclusion of Stage 2, uh, he was still unsatisfied with uh, where the bill was, I would be happy to speak to him further uh, to see if uh, he believes more still needs to be done and we can do it together. But, uh, as I said, I would anticipate there to be uh, further developments later in the bill covering the entirety of the bill rather than being narrowly focused on CPPs. Thank you. Um, Alec Rowley to wind up and to press her withdraw. Um, thank you, convener. Um, just to come to Stuart Stevenson's point, he just mis misunderstands um, what's, what's intended. It's not about trying to tell communities how to consult. It's about um, Putting, putting the statutory, the national guidelines into statute so that um, community planning partners um, and their consultation will, will abide by uh, national recognised standards um, for community engagement. I welcome the fact that the Minister says that the national standards are to be updated and refreshed, and I think that needs to happen. Um, a key point would be that, that when, when doing so, um, I, I really can't understand why we wouldn't then um, set minimum standards for consultation by public bodies. Uh, I certainly don't have the same enthusiasm at this stage for this bill that he does in terms of how it's going to transform um, the engagement of communities and get a lot of these public bodies to actually engage to the extent that they need to be engaging and to have communities set their own agenda. I actually don't think that, that, that this bill as it stands is going to do that, but I want to work with him to try and, and improve it. I'm happy at this stage, given the commitment that he gives, to, um, to withdraw the amendment in order that we can have that discussion and discuss it further, because if we both want to achieve the same thing, which is um, to, to have communities set their agenda, then, then let's work for that. So I'm happy to withdraw at the stage on that yeah, commitment that the Minister has given. Thank you. Um, are the committee content that uh, Mr Rowley withdraws Amendment 1069? Yes. Thank you. Uh, we will deal with uh, Amendment 1070 and a number of other amendments that we have discussed today um, at future meetings. Uh, that uh, ends consideration of amendments for today. Uh, I'd remind members that amendments to parts 3 and 5 of the, of the bill should be lodged with the clerks and the legislation team by 12 noon this Friday. Can I thank members for their participation uh, today um, and for your uh, patience uh, with the convener. Uh, I sus suspend and we now move into private session. <laughs>